today, Dr. Elizabeth Ransom, provides a great example of that. When we thought of somebody on campus who could participate in this series, her name kind of jumped to She's global. The stuff that she's talking, that she's studying and researching has direct relevance to sustainability and issues. Um, so we're really pleased that she's agreed to give this talk today in the middle of a, a busy week. And um, this may be your last event of the week, but not promise. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so Dr. Ransom's in the Department of Sociology. She um, does her research on uh, um, globalization and development, food issues, um, gender issues um, around the world. You're, she has a book on rural America. She has um, research ongoing in Uganda that I'm fascinated by, tying together a lot of those storylines. Um, and today she's here to talk about some, some of her work that she does in Southern Africa, talking about sustainability and uh, the directions. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Ransom. Thank you for participating. Thank you. Let's do it Thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, I'm not mic'd, so hopefully I stay loud enough for you to hear. I actually see you well. The faces are coming out of the woodwork. Welcome back from being brought. Um, so I have a couple things. First, I want to thank Todd Looking Bill and Nancy Cropes for organizing this um, and organizing the whole speaker series. I assume some of you have been to some of the others, and they're quite good, and they're well attended, so I really appreciate that. Um, and I also want to thank my student research assistant, Natasha Shannon. She's worked on a portion of this, which I'll highlight a little later. Uh, first, I'm going to sort of give you some background to sort of where we're headed in this talk. I'm, I'm really going to focus on a global sustainability initiative that's happening for beef. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and sort of, I'm going to critique it, sadly. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about why I'm critiquing it in the context of Southern Africa. And in the case of Southern Africa, you have two big factors. One is the racial politics, the history of Southern Africa, the way in which basically opportunities and economic, um, really uh, economic opportunities have been um, stratified by race. And then you also have the issue of conservation in Southern Africa and the way that intersects with livestock. So I'm going to talk about those two issues in terms of Southern Africa, really reflecting back on this global sustainability initiative being put forth by some big actors. Um, and then I'm going to sort of look at other similar initiatives, like the Sustainable Beef Initiative, and forecast where I see it headed, barring some massive sort of diversion, um, because there have been a few other similar roundtable initiatives that have uh, some good academic literature supporting them. Um, the first thing I'm going to clarify is Southern Africa. What am I talking about? There's a big region. The United Nations actually counts five countries in Southern Africa. My research takes place, and you're going to see it again on the maps here, but Namibia, which is over here, uh, Botswana, and South Africa. These are the three places where I've done the bulk of my research, and they are the most relevant to the conversation about sustainable beef, in, in large part because of their production. All three countries are involved in export and import of beef. And so that makes them pretty relevant to a conversation about global trade and global sustainability efforts. So um, there was a great interactive, somewhat interactive online uh, series on NPR recently focused on the Amazonian rainforest. And I put the link here on, with the hopes that a few of you would go to it. It's a really well done piece. Um, but one of the points they make is that two thirds of Brazil's deforested rainforest is used for cattle ranching. And the vast majority of that beef isn't eaten by Brazilians, it's actually eaten by people in the United States. Um, and obviously, this is a big concern, and here's a great quote from the interactive piece. It says, Brazil now has the eighth largest economy in the world. The economy is diverse, but a significant amount of it was built on the destruction of the rainforest. It allows Brazil to feed itself and the world. McDonald's, among other actors, is now interested in trying to source sustainable beef. Um, and in particular, they're particularly trying to source beef that's not coming off of uh, former rainforest lands. This is a good thing. And I'm not going to downplay that. I think it's really important um, action by one of the largest purchasers of beef in the world. Um, and it's clearly a real problem. But ultimately, there's a lot of sort of issues that get raised when you begin to talk about sustainable beef in different parts of the world. So while Brazil is the focus, uh, this global beef initiative is trying to go global. And ultimately, <coughs> how does this relate to South or Southern Africa? Um, most of you, you think of a hamburger, you think the U.S., you, and if you ask Europeans, they think of the U.S. What you don't realize is there's actually a large group of cattle in Southern Africa that have a long cultural history um, by a lot of people in that region, and ultimately their byproducts, including beef, offal, and skins that come from the cows, play a surprisingly important role for this region. 
The WWF says most of the world's beef is produced in Australia, Brazil, Southern Africa, and the United States. Unlike many other agricultural commodities, cattle have significant impacts on a wide range of ecosystems. The WWF, along with McDonald's, is a part of the founding members of this Global Beef Initiative. It's called the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, or GRSB. Um, they are two of the founding members, but other members include, and you're going to recognize some names here, Cargill, which is a massive uh, global entity in food processing, pickling grain, Alonco, which is an animal health pharmaceutical company, JBS, it's one of four largest beef processors in the world, Merck Animal Health, it's another pharmaceutical company, Solidaridad, which some of you may be more familiar with than I am, they actually do a lot of work in Latin America, but they now are in Southern Africa, they're a large civil society NGO, and finally, and probably the one you know best, is Walmart and Sam's Club. Um, and so these are the founding members, and while you obviously recognize the name, there's something important here to note that once I say it, you're going to go, well, yeah, duh, but it's not obvious when I first uh, am showing you the list, is it's important to note that this is an initiative taking place solely in the private sector, and this is a real transformation in our food system. In the past 20 years, you've seen a rise of so-called private standards, and these are not government regulations. So ultimately, what these are referring to are private, voluntary standards that are basically becoming, almost some people argue, a more important technique for governing our food system than traditional government regulation. And what this means is these standards um, are claiming to overcome the cap limited capacity of states, or in some cases, they simply are meant to collaborate with states to sort of deregulate and re-regulate our food system. Many scholars argue this isn't a complete retreat of the state. The state hasn't withered. For no, in other words, the United States obviously is still very active in, our, in regulating our food. What they see is this has become a, a form of re-regulation where you have private um, standards collaborating with public or quasi-public standards. This is called re-articulated regulation by some, and it draws attention to the way in which whole sectors are now being governed through standards. And these standards mark governance field characterized by a complex configuration of deregulation and different modes of re-regulation. It is a political field that poses itself as depoliticized, and there's emphasis on this sentence. I'm going to take it out of the context of beef for a second, even though the Global Roundtable on, uh, for Sustainable Beef is a private initiative. I'm going to take something you're probably more familiar with is organics. Organics basically grew out of the private sector, and there were more and more consumers basically buying organics, and really in the 1990s, the USDA, the government, realized, hmm, there's all these companies running around claiming they're growing organic, and consumers are buying, willing to pay more for it, but we're not regulating that. We don't have any sense of what's really organic. You, the consumer, have no idea, barring you going to a lab and start testing, you don't know that the process, quote unquote, is organic. And so USDA got involved and drafted um, an organic standard for what would count as quote unquote organic. In 1997, they issued that to the public. And this is an important point, but public regulation always has to go through public vetting. Private regulation does not. And so they issued the standard to the public in 1997, and they, it holds the record as the largest number of public comments ever received for a standard being issued. It was 275,000 people wrote in via email, as well as telephones, as well as writing to critique the standard that had been published. And a part of that is because the industry had had a heavy hand in helping to craft the organic standard, and so it had a lot of things in it that many, many people were offended by. Based on that, that public comment period, they went back to the drawing board, they revised it, and they ultimately issued a, a formal USDA organic standard in 2002. Um, so it's been around for a while, and that's when you buy organic now, um, you're paying for ultimately that seal of approval saying, in fact, this is organic. That's not to say that there aren't products out there that are actually or are organic, uh, but are, they're not labeled. In other words, you could buy products that are seemingly organic, but they don't have that official label. And the reason they don't have that label is because despite USDA regulating who gets to label it, the way you get approved as a producer is you have to pay private sector people to approve your auditing all on way, and that's really expensive. So there's a lot of people, um, growers throughout the world, and I have to tell you, my research in Uganda, I'm really surprised to see the amount of USDA organic labels on products in Uganda. So there's people all over the world uh, that want to have that label so they can sell their product to you at a higher price, um, but they simply can't afford it. But they have to pay the private sector to approve and say that in fact they are meeting these criteria. So that's an example of a private standard that then had quasi-public involvement and sort of this intermingling and the ways in which that's changed in the past 20 years. Historically, 
private sector really had minimal say in terms of standard setting for public sort of consumers. Now, ultimately, private standards can be set in many ways. And many of you might be familiar from this, particularly like if you're in an economics course, um, it can come out of individual firms, for example, McDonald's or Walmart. They all have private standards. Um, it can also come from industry associations. You can have the beef commodity checkoff board setting standards. It can come from non-governmental um, actors, civil society, NGOs, or it can come from multi-stakeholder initiatives. And this is where the GRSB is coming out of, and it's where the bulk of private standards are now emerging, is the um, multi-stakeholder initiatives. There's a good reason for this. Um, from a public point of view, they're a little skeptical, shall we say, of other types of private standards, for example, Walmart, uh, because they're concerned about sort of bias, for example, retailer bias. And so multi-stakeholder initiatives are thought to be more legitimate because you have more stakeholders at the table of different interests. So I showed you the list of the GRSB. You have McDonald's, but you also have a pharmaceutical company, and you also have a major retailer. And so that's many different interests coming to a table in this multi-stakeholder initiative. Um, the GRSB is an example of what I would describe as a flooding of the marketplace of sustainability standards. You effectively, whether you realize it or not, that now you can go home your grocery stores on your snow day um, and study all the labels that are out there today, but we have effectively seen a flooding of the marketplace of these so-called sustainability standards. The unique aspect of these, they're all coming out primarily out of the private sector, and they're all process standards, meaning you as a consumer have no way of knowing whether or not it's actually true. You have to trust the label that is, in fact, backing up and saying, indeed, this is a fair trade banana, for example. So some of you have seen some of these labels, fair trade, salmon save, um, the Rainforest Alliance. And historically, governments regulated product standards, so like the size or shape of something, or even how uh, the size of a, a packaging in a grocery store. Uh, but process standards have emerged through the private sector because they recognize the opportunity for a market. You are willing to pay more for these types of process standards. And so ultimately, um, here is a list summarizing a lot of initiatives that are out there in the private sector. Not all of these are roundtables, but it does give you a sense of sort of chron chronology of the building of these sustainability standards and the different groups involved. And they've changed names, some of them have changed names, like the Better Sugar Cane Initiative became something else. Um, not all of them make it to the marketplace in a form that you would recognize, but they are very active. Um, of course, what I'm interested in here today of what um, the academic literature I reference quite a bit focuses in specifically on roundtables because they are somewhat unique in their formation and they're rather recent. And so there's been a lot of literature um, that's been out there about the sustainable palm oil as well as uh, responsible soy. There's a little less literature on biofuels, um, but it is another example of a roundtable initiative. Okay. So for my purposes, I want to talk a little bit about the context of Southern Africa when we're talking about sustainable beef and trying to sort of come up with standards for sustainable beef. And I mentioned earlier, but I'm going to come back to it, is there's a really long history of and importance of cattle in the region. Um, it's crude, and I know I have a few historians in here, but I'm going to lump histories here. So the best way to think about the history of cattle in this region is to lump it into sort of indigenous smallholders versus colonial cattle economies. Um, cattle have tended to serve different purposes for these two groups. For indigenous smallholders in the region, first and foremost, cattle have been a sign of wealth and status. And that's still true today. The more cattle you own, the sign that you're wealthier, the sign that you have more status in your community. They've also, of course, um, at times been used as a mechanism for food security, although that's less because, again, this is about wealth and status, and slaughtering your wealth is never a good thing. Uh, but it is a form of food security. And then finally, and it's still used very much today, uh, particularly in Botswana, uh, I know quite a few people who, they still do dowry for cattle, meaning if you're a groom, um, your family negotiates with the bride's family and you give a certain number of cows in, in sort of, it's a trade. They get cows, you get their daughter. Um, and so effectively, these are the ways in which you find smallholders using cattle. Uh, and that continues to this day, but it's been a, it's a long, long tradition. Um, it's quite well documented. On the flip side is colonial cattle economies. And they have long used cattle to serve their own purposes. Uh, the British in particular did it pretty well in South Africa. They first and foremost used it to feed their armies and their miners. So when they first arrived in the Southern African region, um, they very much used the cattle that were present and bargained and bartered and sometimes stole the cattle in order to feed laborers and their military. 
The second thing they did is they started exporting cattle to Europe, and that surprises many people to hear that, but there's a long trade in cattle from Southern Africa to Europe, and that continues to this day. And then the final thing um, that they did with their cattle was ultimately they established commercial white farmers. Um, white farm, commercial farms are throughout this region. You find whites throughout the region. Um, some are more recent. They actually came from Zimbabwe and have settled since the whole unrest in Zimbabwe. But it was a mechanism for establishing their own colonies and settler states was to establish these commercial white farms. Um, so very different politics. And you still, again, find this massive divide today of the vast majority of highly successful industrialized commercial beef operations are white owned. And then you have a much larger smallholder population of indigenous people who own cattle in much smaller amounts of land, a much smaller amount of land. Um, and so that divide is still present, and that really has a bearing on this issue of sustainability standards and thinking about beef, which I'm arguing is not being taken into consideration. The other thing I would say is I've been working in this region since 1998, and I've seen a lot of changes in terms of the trade of beef. Namibian and Botswana have historically shipped 80% of all cattle slaughtered to Europe. Cattle is very valuable for them as an export. That is changing. Europe is getting more difficult in order, they're setting harder and harder standards, like animal welfare standards. And so Botswana and Namibia's trade is getting more and more disrupted, um, which is problematic for an, from an economic point of view. The other massive change I've witnessed since 1998 is South Africa used to gear to export meat. And in that time, they had a massive growth of the middle class in South Africa. And what that means is an explosion in the number of people eating meat. And so they actually now are net importers. Whereas they used to strive when I first started, they were striving to export. They do still export, but they export to niche markets with specialized products. What they often will do is they ship parts, meaning they export out certain parts that can fetch a higher price in the international market, and they import in cheaper parts, like offal, offal is the intestines. Um, and so it's very interesting to see sort of the changes in global trade and beef in this region. But there's another really important point as it pertains to South Africa, beyond the fact that they dominate this region um, in many, many ways, economically, but also in terms of ag policy, is that in the time I've been studying South Africa, feedlots now dominate. They provide almost, it's probably around 80% of the all beef consumed in South Africa today comes off of feedlots, and these are white-owned feedlots. And that has real ramifications as we begin to talk about who benefits from a sustainability standard. So, with that in mind, I'm going to move on to give you sort of an image of what I'm talking about when I talk about these wide range of production systems. What you see here are images from the region, and I'm sorry I don't have any from Namibia. It's a really amazing place um, if you ever get to go. Uh, but the top is an intensive feedlot. It's one of many now in South Africa. It's very similar to what you see here in the U.S., and that's what we call you know, intensive beef production. On the bottom are examples of what we call extensive communal grazing. Uh, there are little different models. The one on the left in Botswana is literally um, cows roam long distances and with occasionally what they call cattle boys. These can be grown men, but cattle boys come, running, come around and eventually sort of gather the cattle back together. Um, but occasionally they do have some go missing. And here in South Africa it's also extensive, but this is more centered around a, a well, a borehole, um, meaning they don't go as far afield into grazing lands. But these are all really different production systems with really different needs and, of course, very different environmental impacts. Um, a great quote that I found recently, actually, from a 2012 article in the Mel and Guardian Africa, regard, it really speaks to the racial politics and the racial history. It's not only focused on the apartheid system and how it impacted people, but something you've probably not given a lot of thought to of how it impacted cows. Uh, so I'll just read the quote to you. It says, what is not widely known is that long before Dr. Uh, D.F. Milan, sorry, had dreamt of apartheid for people, the South African government practiced a system of apartheid for cattle. Botswana cattle weighing less than 340 kilograms could not be imported or exported to South Africa for slaughter. To reach the weight, it meant that these cattle had to be reared on white on farms where feed was abundant. And so through technical specifications of weight, they actually barred the importation of cattle from Botswana, where primarily indigenous smallholders have the extensive grazing, through the cows basically were too skinny. Um, the important point here is this protected the white farmers of South Africa. This protected them from competition. They, they had a corner on the market for selling their beef. I would also add it wasn't just through technical sort of standards that they did this. They did it physical barriers that are still present today. They um, put fences in place 
that ultimately sought to block the movement of both people and animals. And so here in Namibia is basically a fence. It's literally a fence. Um, you can drive to it, and you cross over it, you have to go through a checkpoint. Uh, and behind that fence sit a whole lot of cattle. By Basically through interviews I've had with people, by some estimates they say 50% of all cattle in Namibia actually sit behind this line. The importance of that is if the cattle sit behind this line, they're not available for sale in the formal marketplace. Uh, they're considered a threat to um, the sanctity of disease-free zones, which are all the zones sitting south of these fences. There's a lot of money flowing into northern Namibia right now by the likes of USAID as well as the Gates Foundation. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why, but I want to note that Botswana has an elaborate series of fences, again, to try to maintain these disease zones where all these cattle are with indigenous smallholders and the disease-free zones where you find commercial farms, um, which are primarily white owned and South Africa, again, as well. Now, there's a similarity in all three of these, and you'll see in a little while, these tend to rub up against wildlife zones. This is where the conservation story comes in. So many of these indigenous populations who were forced, forcefully removed from a lot of the land they could sit on are now sitting in areas that rub up against conservation areas, which means that their cattle are at risk for carrying diseases from wildlife into disease-free cows. And so, of course, apartheid ended, and it's no longer cool or acceptable to limit the movement of, of people, but they still limit the movement of cows. It still um, continues to be an issue that I can bore you to tears with, but I won't. Um, I just want to show you what it looks like. This is crossing into Botswana from the Zambia border, and this is what you go through in order to get into the country to assure you're not moving diseases that will affect cattle. Um, so what you have here is the cars drive through the puddle there, which has disinfectant to basically cleanse the underside of the carriages of cars. Um, and it's, in particular, you probably heard foot and mouth disease. This is a big one they're trying to protect against, because foot and mouth disease is a major, easily spread disease in, endemic to wildlife. Um, the other thing they make you do, which I find kind of funny, because really putting a lot of trust into humans, is they require you to go dig in your bags and get out all your shoes and dip them in the wash. And it's just funny because I can imagine there's a lot of people that don't want to be bothered with digging into their bags to get their shoes and no one goes looking. But I, in theory, you're also cleansing yourself so that you're not bringing in the disease into the, uh, to these spaces. So the point here is people can now move through these spaces, but they still highly regulate animal movement. And of course, in, increasing uh, recently, actually, I'll let you pause here and just say that what's going on here is increasingly there's a lot of people that are trying to get rid of these fences. And they're doing this for a couple reasons. They're interested in all these cattle that sit behind these fences that are currently not available for the marketplace. And by they, I'm just a big they at this moment. They're also interested in economic opportunity, um, economic development opportunities. Most people that sit behind these fences, they have all these resources of cattle, but they're not allowed to sell them at a fair market price because there's no market for the cattle. Uh, and so they see this as an opportunity to help these people sort of uh, elevate their economic standing and of course, this is an opportunity to increase the amount of beef to export, which is not unlike what we do with Australia, Brazil, the US, even India now, is in the sort of global export of beef. And of course, I would argue this is a perfect reason we need sustainability standards, because anytime you begin to, um, to intensify or economically develop beef production, you tend to find more and more environmental degradation. So there is a real tension here and, and really thinking strategically about opportunities for sustainability in the region. So, Getting to the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, they have officially adopted a mission and a vision and a, what they call their accompanying principles and criteria. So their vision is a, a world in which all aspects of the beef value chain are environmentally sound, socially responsible, and economically viable. For those of you in sustainability studies, this is a classic sort of corporate definition of sustainability. Um, it's sort of the triple bottom line. Um, to give you an understanding of what I mean by this is they have five principles of it's on the next slide. They have five principles that they have adopted with accompanying criteria. Now, ultimately, um, they, they, uh, they are seeking to, right now, to establish these high-level principles and criteria. They purposely say they want it to be a high level so it can be applied throughout the world. Um, they have purposely avoided the more, what I say, nitty-gritty of what that's going to look like in terms of what they call their indicators, whether, metrics, and practices. Uh, they are asking that regional bodies develop these to be most suitable to the local context, which sounds pretty appealing, actually. Um, it's this idea that we're going to create a global idea of what we're striving for, but you're going to figure out how to do it on the ground in a way that's appropriate to your space. 
Um, and so you have these five um, principles. And just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about, I'm going to show you number five off the, you can go on the website and look at this. So number five is the principle of efficiency and innovation. What they've done here, if you can see this, I don't know if that's blurry or not, um, they have intent, so they explain what they mean by this, and then they have criteria. Um, and there's nine criteria. Criteria vary. Um, the, for example, the very first criteria up there basically is implying that you need to work to get the right kind of breeds, uh, cow breeds, to suit your environment, all the while keeping in check market forces. So there's a lot of tension there, because you can get breeds that are great for a certain environment like a desert, but they're not particularly great to eat. And so they're, they're basically trying to get you to recognize you have to sort of meet in the middle. Find a good breed, but that people still want to eat it. Because uh, a lot of indigenous breeds are quite tough. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on criteria today. I really want to focus in on the principles. Although we could have a lively discussion about um, the criteria. So there's these five pr principles. And ultimately, the DRFB has strongly supported a scientific basis for decisions or recommendations of, of four of these five um, principles. And from a sociological point, this is immediately troubling, but also predictable in terms of turning to a use of science to try to create standards. The reason it's troubling is the so-called scientization of governance. Many scholars have talked about this. I just happen to give you a quote from one named Abby Kinchy um, from her most recent book focused on the debates over GMOs and our agricultural system. Um, she ultimately defines sort of the scientization of governance as um, whereby there is a transformation of a social conflict into a debate ostensibly separated from its social context among scientific experts. And so I'm going to sort of drag this out to so make sure you get this point. Is so what you have when you start thinking about scientizing sustainability standards is the first thing you recognize is you're going to lose certain people. They're no longer going to be at the table. So generally what we see in the scientization of governance is you begin to exclude less powerful people. This isn't as always obvious as you might think, what happens is less powerful people don't have the right language to be able to sit at the table. Because when you scientize something, it picks up a lot of scientific jargon. Um, and that's not meant to be derogatory. That's just the nature of the beast. And so when you get people that are less powerful, they simply no longer have a voice because they, don't, they can't even communicate the same language with the scientization. Does that make sense? The next point is it tends to stifle debate over the social organization of agriculture. And I can't emphasize this enough. It is amazing to me that smallholders still exist in Southern Africa because we have done everything through development policies to try and get rid of them. And yet, there is something to be said for thinking about smallholder <coughs> agriculture and the ways in which it sustains more than simply an efficient agricultural production system. It gives culture, it gives meaning, it gives uh, food security to local communities. And so when you scientize a discussion about sustainability, you are moving away from debating, but wait a minute, what kind of food system do we want? And then the final thing I'm really relevant to Southern Africa is it tends to divorce the relevance of history uh, to the governance structure. And so suddenly, in scientizing these sustainability discussions, you're, you're wiping away that whole racial past of Southern Africa, um, unless, unless these local regional bodies choose to bring it to the fore. Um, and I'll discuss here momentarily why I'm skeptical that's going to happen. But these are all really important points of thinking about what's wrong with talking about scientific standards for gauging sustainability. But it's also the biggest reason they turn to science is they want to move forward. They want people to agree. And science has a way of settling debate. Say, so if we can all agree on the standard, we can move forward. And so it's a logical turn, but it's also a troubling one if you understand the consequences. So the next way I'm going to turn, I mentioned race and the ways it has played out in cattle ownership. Now I'm going to talk about the way conservation has played out on the ground. Um, but something that's really important to understand is that if you look at the continent of Africa, the environmental initiatives have become one of the most important forms of external interventions. Conservation is sort of this, this big initiative happening on the around the globe and being inserted to Africa in many ways. Um, when you think about the rise of private standards for sustainable meat production, it's not just useful, but I would argue necessary that you have to think about the context of conservation practices historically into the present in Southern Africa. In other words, you have to think about not just the marketplace of beef, but the marketplace of environmental conservation, because there's very much a marketplace. So I'm going to give you a quote and then some of the history of conservation in this region. This comes out of scholars who are actually writing about Namibia here, um, but I thought it was a great quote. It says, while the impact of livestock keeping on the Southern African environment is well documented, the influence of nature conservation on livestock keepers plays a minor role in scientific discourse. 
And the point here is our scientific gaze has long focused on the problems that these small indigenous uh, farmers cause to saving wildlife. We rarely have said, but wait a minute, how does our insertion of wildlife and the reestablishment of big parks impact these smallholders who have a lot of capital? Um, and, and so the point here is there's a lot of science to be done to really understand, and science used broadly, I mean social as well as natural sciences, to understand the, con the impact of conservation practices on smallholders or pastoralists. So here's a great summary from the same um, authors, uh, sort of summarizing the conservation history of the region. Um, ultimately, what you see here is from the 1800s to the 1970s is what they call fortress protection, where you created what were effectively all these national parks that hopefully some of you have maybe gotten to go visit in different parts of Africa. The problem, of course, is they tended to remove people from their lands and from indigenous people, and they tended to um, lose the grazing lands for their cattle, so they had a big loss of their cattle population. Um, Today, even, if you talk about conservation or national parks, you still find a strong sentiment among black populations in Namibia and South Africa that associate this national parks as a part of the apartheid regime because they were forcibly removed. I've talked to people in Namibia who say, this is where my grandmother lived when we're in the middle of the Tosha National Park. They point to the location. They have fond memories and they strong connections to this land that they literally were taken off of. And with that, most of the times, they, they lost much of their cattle, which again, was a huge part of their status and wealth. Um, even in areas that don't associate with apartheid, other portions of Africa still associate this first phase of conservation as affiliated with authoritarian rule. Beginning in the 80s and 90s, we saw a turn. And a turn really swept, the sort of was a wave of democratization on the continent, where there was a recognition that, wow, we can't ignore these people. Um, these people should also have a voice, and we should acknowledge at least their loss. And there's a talk of, you know, um, providing some sort of compensation for their loss. And so ultimately this was community-based natural resource management. I'm assuming some of you in here are familiar with it. Um, it was a wave of effectively allowing indigenous people to gain a voice, and they also gained back some grazing lands for their cattle. Unfortunately now what we have is a turn to these trans-frontier conservation areas. It's only unfortunate depending on your point of view. If you're a uh, prairie into the environment, you think these are great. Uh, but they are ultimately sort of disenfranchising indigenous populations again. These are happening at very high levels. These transfrontier conservation areas are trying to open up, get rid of fences, and get rid of nation-state borders. They're trying to create big swaths of land where more animals get put into them. But that also means indigenous people on the ground tend to again lose their voice. They again lose their grazing areas because again, cattle and wildlife are a bad combination from a disease management point of view, and ironically, it also exposes these indigenous populations to higher likelihood of their cows getting sick and dying, um, which is problematic. And so here are the maps I'm going to show you of the conservation areas as they've been proposed, and some are moving forward. These are these trans-frontier or trans-boundary national um, parks. So increasingly, environmentalists have labeled fences, including these fences I described earlier in my talk, as bad. They're bad for the ecosystem. They want to see them come down. Remember, um, I showed you Namibia, their fences are up here, and Botswana's fences are all along here, and South Africa's are right along here, and of course, look where a lot of these parks are going in. They hit the same spaces. Um, environmentalists argue that ultimately, these transfrontier conservation areas will build the tourism industry through wildlife preservation. I would argue the flaw of this, it's not that they won't, they will, but they're ignoring two important aspects, or points from an indigenous cattle owner's point of view. First of all, they're ignoring the cultural significance of cattle because they're saying to these indigenous people, consider getting rid of your cattle and, and buying into these transfrontier parks. And so it's really ignoring a really long history of the importance of cattle um, to these indigenous populations, and they're not likely to have much success. The other thing they're ignoring is who benefits. Cattle production is ultimately directly controlled by indigenous producers, and they see direct income and opportunities from it. In contrast, tourism and conservation overwhelmingly tends to be controlled and owned by foreign customers and companies um, or whites from the region, which have historically been the majority in terms of power. And so there's a real sort of um, oversight or lack of understanding from an environmental point of view of why these aren't, shall we say, beneficial necessarily for indigenous populations. So in the context of all this sort of uh, historical complexity surrounding producers, um, are farmers in Southern Africa likely to have their interests represented in the global roundtable on sustainable beef? Uh, particularly in terms of the indicators, metrics, and practices, because these are going to be the on-ground sort of things that they say you have to do to be labeled sustainable beef. 
Well, the first thing we did is, and this is with the, uh, my help from Natasha, is we looked, we did a content analysis of the claims being made at the high level, at the, the founder's level. And so we ultimately first looked at the GRSB website itself, their annual reports, et cetera. And there's a lot of categories which I've classed. But what I want you to get a sense of is it doesn't bode well for a producer farm level interest. Um, we instead, as you see here, the category is gets significantly less attention overall compared to, for example, the environment. There's a lot of talk about the environment. Um, it gets a lot of attention to value chain efficiency, farm to fork. There's a lot of attention on consumer, consumer safety, and even animal welfare and health. Um, there's far less attention to talking about specific farm level producer concerns. And this is just the overall website. We then went to the supporting founding members of, these, um, of this group and we coded, we also coded JBS. We did not code Walmart, Elanto, and Merck because they just simply didn't have anything out there for public consumption yet. Um, but these four we coded, and I'll tell you in a second, it's JBS. Um, and what you see is Solidarita is the one on the ground working with farmers. And indeed, what their rhetoric on the you know, web for you to search and to um, study, they actually do talk a lot about farmer and producer interests. They're actually active right now in the media. Um, Aside from them, though, you see that quickly farmer and producer interests fall out of the big picture. Um, so World Wildlife Federation gets a fair amount of attention, but obviously their biggest thing is the environment. Uh, and Cargill, none at all. And McDonald's, they get a little, but they have a lot of other interests at work. Um, JDS, we did code, but they didn't have much to work with. And the only code area they fell into was the value chain efficiency. And JDS is a slaughter of cattle. So they don't, there's nothing about farmers uh, on their website. So that's sort of the top down, like will producers interest be represented? What about the bottom up? Since they're leaving it to the regional bodies to sort of represent their interest, how will farmers make out, particularly smallholders, indigenous communities in Southern Africa? And so this is where I'm gonna to turn to studies of other round tables and tell you what they found and then extrapolate out. Um, the first thing they find is most of these round tables are not highly inclusive, in fact, J the Global Roundtable on Sustainable Beef is an exception. They are the only roundtable that has included participants from Africa. Um, all the other roundtables, former roundtables that have been enacted, have no African representation. The weird part of JRB, uh, SB, Global Roundtable on Sustainable Beef, is there's no one from Asia. And I say that's weird because Asia's are going to be our largest consumer of beef in the coming, in the future. Uh, and, they're, and India actually just jumped to the lead in being the largest exporter of beef. Um, made a lot of headlines. And so it, it's a bit curious in terms of who is in the round table. The membership has grown, uh, but by and large, it's not highly inclusive. It's not including me and you and our thoughts or opinions. It's including high level big actors. Um, it tends to exclude radical solutions. Round tables, by their nature, or by who's involved with them, tend to go for much more practical, pragmatic solutions. And this, of course, if, you're, if you follow some of the critiques of cattle production, has pretty big ramifications for just how much sustainability we're going to see coming out of this particular roundtable. Um, in this case, this roundtable will have a market impact. You saw the players, they are huge. It will have a market impact, but it's going to be pretty limited in terms of who got to have input. And so there is an inverse. You can have a roundtable that, get, that actually has really amazing, um, sets these amazing sort of holistic sustainability criteria. But then it gets no market traction, and that's it's just as bad, right? Is if you have this a great roundtable that produces this wonderful standard, but then no one adopts it, you haven't really achieved anything. And so in this case, JR, JRSB is definitely going to have an impact. McDonald's, McDonald's really drove this because they want to be able to source sustainable beef. Uh, however, again, it's going to be a pretty limited input um, from a pretty select group of actors in terms of what kind of standards get set. Um, the fourth outcome is. The outcomes will privilege and incentivize individual farmers. What this means is as standards get set, it rewards individual farmers that can meet the standards. And from a point of view of understanding the smallholder who are a unique population in Southern Africa that face unique but structural challenges, this is problematic. Smallholders need um, changes as a whole. It, they need specific uh, market access across the board and then what's going to happen here is there might be a few smallholders that make it um, and they can actually achieve getting the sustainability stamp, but the vast majority won't because these are geared to individuals who are already well capitalized and ready to act, i.e. making feedlots. Um, the other thing I would add is remember I said, okay, maybe regionally they'll represent, for example, indigenous smallholders, 
Well, you have to remember, I started by saying South Africa has 70% uh, or more of all beef produced comes off of feedlots that are um, historically white commercial farmers. And that doesn't bode well either. So they're going to be at the table. They'll, they'll definitely be at the table in terms of building the metrics and practices and indicators on the ground. But they're not going to represent the interests of this large population of smallholders that we're referring to. They simply won't because they don't need to, and it's not in their interests. Um, and so these are all sort of alarming. And unfortunately, this suggests that, in fact, uh, the standards will be, sorry, the standards will be quite limited um, in terms of their impact for thinking about sustainability over a larger population of people in Southern Africa that have cattle. It's going to be limited probably to a select few, mainly feedlots. Uh, I'll end with this quote because I think it speaks to some of the trouble that you find, um, which is that this has implications not just for thinking about sustainability in our food system, but also thinking about conservation and livelihoods. Um, this is a quote from an organization that has been somewhat involved in these roundtables, but they make this uh, really important point that historically neither governments, non-governmental organizations, the aid community, nor academia have holistically addressed the landscape level nexus represented by the triangle of wildlife health, domestic animal health, and human health and livelihoods as underpinned by environmental stewardship. And my point being here is the sustainability, global sustainability initiative, I have no doubt will come out with standards, but in its current context, it will do a very poor job of bringing these holistic and these different data points together to recognize the unique challenges on the ground in Southern Africa. And I'm going to end there. Thanks. And I personally ended with the idea of having a conversation. As you can imagine, if you stuck with me, there's a lot I did more about. So I'm, I mean, I'm wide open for questions. And then we have time for questions. I can start. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about um, the reasons for the transition from community-based to transplant to your con um, uh, conservation. Um, why, uh, um, and why, they're ex why, why they need to be exclusive. <laughs> but it seems like there's a scale difference, but it doesn't seem like they necessarily need to be exclusive. Um, uh, it could be complementary. Right. You don't have to exclude the locals on the ground necessarily. The problem is these are such big political animals because they're having to negotiate <coughs> across nations that there's some high-level negotiation happening. Uh, and there's simply no, there's no one saying, hey, wait a minute, let's talk to the people on the ground. Uh, at least no one at those high levels. There are plenty of people. There's a great book I just ordered, um, an edited volume looking at this very topic. Uh, there are plenty of academics running around out there going, you know, this is a real shame. There are real opportunities to, to further enlist indigenous smallholders. Uh, but they're currently not happening, and, and a large part of that is because the politics to simply establish this park are so big and, and require such high-level negotiation that they're just kind of getting cut out of the conversation. So it's primarily a scale issue. Mm -hmm. It is a scale issue. scale than the communities and Absolutely. Although I must confess, I'm more of a cow person than I am a transfer to your park person. So. Dylan. Um, so among the, among the groups that you said, like the subsistence farmers and the um, big cow farmers and the um, feedlots and stuff, which, um, like, what, what is the most sustainable? Obviously not the feedlots, but, like, are the, are the farmers that are just doing subsistence farming, like, you know, if they have so many cattle, you say, like, are they just kind of correcting the environment, or is, that, is it like a, you know, may, maybe, like, yes, that's the livelihood, but it's not really a good way to go about caring for the earth, or what, what do you say? So I think it's a great question because I think in your coming years you're going to see so many politics surrounding that question. There are people out there that argue feedlots are the best way to move forward because they argue it's about doing more with less intensification. I personally am super critical of that point of view. Um, I think it's greenwashing a lot. Um, but certainly I think, I, I'm going to say there's a lot of evidence that's been collected that suggests smaller producers with more mixed farming systems would be a far more long-term sustainable approach and also provide more food security for communities uh, as opposed to commodity production. Um, so there are opportunities. At the moment, most smallholders in Southern Africa don't have enough land to operate sustainably. Uh, South Africa is a great example. They've only reallocated, I think, 1% of all land back to, or maybe it's 2% now, to indigenous blacks. And this is at the time of independence. I'm going to look at Dr. Summers there in the back. At the time of independence, am I right in saying that 90% of all land was owned by whites? It's really a high percentage. You do know somewhere in there. It's a, but it's around 90% was owned by whites. And since, into, since the end of apartheid, they've only managed to reallocate 2% of that land back to the smallholders, despite the fact that they are the vast majority of the population. 
And so you have a situation where small owners currently get hammered for being very, uh, having a lot of environmental degradation, but that's also because they've been shoved on very small pieces of land. Um, and you know, so it, Namibia is actually doing a better job of reallocating lands, um, although there's a lot of critiques there too. Uh, you could argue if you put some of the smallholders into workable spaces and gave them the appropriate resources, they could be actually quite sustainable over the long haul. Um, sorry, I'm trying to follow. Um, I know that uh, at least in, in America, a big problem with um, you know cattle grazing like this is the water usage. Um, mm -hmm. And I know Africa is not one of the desert, but um, I'm not that familiar with Southern Africa. Like, how is the, is the water getting being drained? Are they are this is causing droughts? Or what's you know, it's, it's interesting. So a lot of the indigenous breeds actually can, uh, shall we say, survive, and not thrive, but on slightly less water. So I mean, this is an interesting thing to think about in terms of breeds. Uh, there are breeds that can do with less water. Uh, it's a pretty dry region. Um, the feedlots, uh, feedlots are comical in this region because water is scarce. Um, they are drawing too much in South Africa on the water resources for agriculture as a whole. Namibia, they have started feedlotting, and that's laughable. Namibia is a desert. There's no sense in having a feedlot. Um, but there are people trying to do it uh, because it's feedlotting is water intensive, it's more so than um, grazing. And so it's highly problematic over the long haul for these desert regions that are only going to get more and more desert by most productions. Uh, yeah. So uh, the argument that uh, the national parks are actually going to bring in more money instead of having people have their own land and do their own farming. I mean, the national parks have, have been around and they started coming up at least by the 1970s, right? I mean, is that true? Do they actually bring in more money? Well, so, you know, so again, I'm not a park expert, but my understanding of many of the parks in the region is they tend to be privately owned by foreign companies or local whites. South Africa is a prime example. A lot of cattle farmers in South Africa have shifted to game farming, meaning people in the U.S. literally pay, I asked once on a plane, found out $50,000 a person to come in and shoot certain species of animal on the farm. It's way, way more profitable. Um, depending on what school of economics you subscribe to, maybe trickle down might work. Um, but the problem is, a lot of indigenous people never see any of this cash. Um, this isn't money that's going into their pocket. This is money going flowing away from them. And so again, this comes back to who's controlling ultimately um, that money. I do think conservation and tourism are going to grow. I mean, uh, you know, I, whatever. I can't predict the future. Don't believe me. But I, I, tourism is going to become bigger and bigger on the continent. I mean, it, it, we have you know, whole populations of animals that are effectively dying out, and, and these spaces will become places where people can go and see them. Um, so there is growth opportunity, but what I'm suggesting is not going to go to the people that we're looking at in cattle ownership. So you were criticizing the roundtable for not including the local voice mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. Do you think there are other like ways to approach um, including them, but also considering environmental issues and like working under the umbrella of the politics there. Yes, uh, it's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. There's nothing right now for beef. In organics, what you see happen, and it's happening throughout like Colombia and large parts of Latin America, and even actually Namibia, there are groups coming together, but they're, they're pushing back against these, na these international organic standards because they're too expensive for them to meet, and yet they are organic. Like, I mean, that's kind of the joke of so much of ag production in Africa is organic. Um, and so they are forming new groups and creating their own standards, and they're getting those standards not approved by Walmart. Walmart would never buy their goods, but they're getting them approved regionally, so inter-regional trade. So other people in Colombia are buying their products, knowing that what's a, the restaurants are buying their products, but also, uh, particularly in Southern Africa, there's talk of increasing trade within the region, so increasing exports to Zambia, for example. So there are examples of opportunities to allow the smaller voices to be heard, but still ultimately achieve the end, which is more sustainable ag production. Um, so it's a great question. They are not there yet. And I do think one thing that happens with the round tables, there's a synergy. When they start percolating and creating this, it inspires other groups to start creating their own. There's always a competition for who's going to get the sustainability standard for whatever. And so there's a funny thing that happens is that this will spur other groups to start talking about what's a more appropriate sustainability standard. And that, in and of itself, could be considered a good thing. Uh, because at least it's getting that conversation going. Now you're rushing to go eat Which, by the way, Namibia was really close to getting to start exporting fresh meat to the U.S. That would be the first African country ever. And they were wanting to 
bring in our meat. They were, they were negotiating with Namibia because our cows are too fat, and Namibia has a lot of lean meat because most of their cows are on uh, grazing land. So we needed some of their beef to counter our fat to make our hamburgers. Um, but they had a disease outbreak and that shut that down. So I had to move forward. Yes? This might be outside of, of what you're doing, but I want to go back to cattle as dowry. Mm -hmm. Has that practice changed at all? Are, are there any, is there any progress? Because I would think it would be progress to kind of change that. I don't know. Is it no. So, that? so the only reason it's changed is the concentration of cattle. So in Botswana, there's no real data because everyone's sitting on it. There has been a concentration in wealthy people owning cattle to the point that a lot of people in Botswana don't own cattle. They like to, but they can't. Uh, among those wealthy people, absolutely not. Dowry is a point of pride. Um, I, I worked with a faculty member, a PhD from England, who very much talked about when his daughter gets married and when his son gets married and the use of cattle. And you know, I know it sounds, it, it sounds crass, but it's actually not. I mean, the point is they're acknowledging that you're losing someone of your family, and, and cows like are expensive. So you're, uh, in many ways, and you know, it's not like they're the woman's in the back room and has no voice. Like she's wanting to marry this person okay. in most cases, and then it's a matter of honor. Of you know, I value this person so much, I'm willing to give you five cows. And so, uh, you know, I know from a Western point of view, sometimes it can sound a little shocking, but it's not. Um, I mean, there's variation across the landscape, but the ones I know who've actually done dowry. It's not been as barbaric as it might sound to a Westerner. Um, sort of thinking on that question, like the cattle historically, if they were well, they were more symbol of wealth and status. Was there like something that prompted them to shift into becoming part of the more global market, or is that still like a tension between? Oh, it's still a huge tension. So Gates is pumping millions into Namibia, and I finally got to the north where I heard all about his projects, and um, and person who was supposed to be there and help me translate because not everyone speaks English, um, of course didn't show. And so in my you know, pigeon English, I, I'm asking them, and they're in this big gates program where they're supposed to be you're having commercial farmers. And I said, so how many cows are you seeking to obtain knowing that there's all, management says you can only put so many animals on the land and be profitable. And he looks at me and goes, as many as I can get. And he started dying laughing because he, he, the point is, is it's a huge point for them to have as many cows as possible. It's the best way I can put it is like us going and buying our Porsche. I mean, it's it's a really valuable and very much still part of the culture. The only way it's dying out is what I just said is inequality. The people that simply can't afford the practice. Um, but people who can afford the practice very much are still buying into it. And it rubs up against, but some people argue, um, if you give them enough economic incentive, they'll start selling their cows. It may or may not be true. Um, but it no, there's plenty of smallholders that have zero interest in, first and foremost, making their cows about money. Uh, they, they see their cows as lots of things, and they're not particularly prone to the Western point of view of this cow is simply a commodity to be traded. A lot about cows. <laughs> do they give their cows names? No. You, they do for you? I've seen it, yeah. Oh, yeah? I don't, yeah, you know, that's a good question. I actually, as I said this, I blurted that out. I was like, you know, I don't know that I actually asked that. <laughs> I'll try and do that this summer uh, when I look at dairy. Yeah, yeah, it's harder to eat the one with the name, right? Um, no, I, it, that's a great question. I'll have to, I'll ask. I'll get back to you. <laughs> Is there a chicken round table? I hear a lot about the movement that these same agencies kind of getting decaging chickens. Right. Uh, you know, there's a lot of movement on that, but there is actually, as far as I know, there's not yet a global, which, the interesting thing about chicken, it's more concentrated in the beef globally. Tyson, uh, under different names, basically controls the global marketplace of chicken. Uh, and so you would have to get Tyson to want to come to the table or Chick-fil-A. Uh, you know, I was, when I mentioned Chick-fil-A, I always think of all these chickens. But um, there's not yet. Uh, I don't doubt it's coming. And there's been lots of talk of getting rid of the cages. Lots. And very quietly, y'all may not realize it, thing with Smithfield, for example, they got rid of some of their, some of the practices that you as consumers are most offended by. They didn't publicize it at all. They just simply stopped putting the pigs in a cage where they can't stand up and they just eat. They're basically phasing that out completely. I think by this year it's supposed to be gone. But they didn't advertise it. It's just they recognized that it could go really bad for them if it got out and consumers really harped on it. So they just started quietly shifting to more animal friendly, you know, what else? <laughs> you know, non caged chickens still don't see the light of day. So. <laughs> Yep. Um, in, in many of these in the global 
round table, it won't. You're not going to see dung at all in the Gopher round table. And that's the point. No. I mean, because from a feedlot point of view, the only problem, the dung, the only thing it is is a problem because it's just lagoons of it. Um, and so it's not at all, even though you're absolutely right, is in a more smaller, which goes back to the point I was making with Dylan, smaller production systems utilize a lot more of, the, of every aspect of the cow, particularly the dung. Dung is very valuable. Uh, but feedlots, from their point of view, is strictly a problem. What are other products? Like leather? <coughs> like leather. What, what do they do with the hides? Uh, so exactly almost every products? single one of your cars driving around with leather seats, believe it or not, all of Europe, all the BMWs are leather coming out of Southern Africa. Does that count as sustainable? Uh, you'd have to do a lot to make tanning uh, the whole in leather industry, but they are, yeah, I mean, they're moving, they're trying to make better chemicals, less horrible. Yeah. <laughs> I've actually toured some tanneries. I, I've done a lot of gory tours. Uh, tanneries are really smelly places. Um, Let's thank Dr. Ransom one more time.